How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tier Talk, only show on the air that's dedicated to law enforcement. Don't forget, guys, follow us on multiple venues, iHeartRadio, tune in, YouTube, Spreaker.com, Player FM, Stitcher Radio, list is growing. Like the page on Facebook, guys, like that page, help me get, help me get my numbers up, and also download the app, it's a free app, it's a Tier Talk app, it's... Uh, uh, available on iOS and also Samsung devices. Now today, my guest is Matt Gallup. Matt, how are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. Like happy to be here. Uh, Matt, Matt Gallup fun. obviously is the founder of yeah, or founder of the Body Beacon uh, by Rescue Leaders. Uh, it's the world's first patented LED equipped belt keeper. Now, before we start our show, I just want to say thank you for Six Brothers. We're, in case you guys don't know, we're at Six Brothers, which is up on Little Falls, right? Little yeah, Falls, Little Falls, New Jersey, Passaic County. Route right. 46 yeah. East. East. Yeah, so uh, uh, right now, what I, I got food coming my way. I ordered a uh, Mexican wrap. Right. right. And then what did you order? I went with the lamb. I, I'm, I'm excited about the, the, I think the Indian lamb. I think uh, he went with the lamb because I'm paying for it. That's true. That's <laughs> yeah. true. And my family's on its way, too. They're, they're coming in later on. Tony can pick up that bill, too. Oh, what? Is your family coming? No, I'm just making uh, that up. Just making nerves. You never know him, Matt. He tells a lot of stories. Yeah, you know. Okay. As you can see, I got a little equipment in front of me. One is the phone so I can do my camera angles, and the other one is just uh, what we got going on here. So first off, um, I, I want to start off by obviously uh, showing our final respects to three fallen officers um, uh, in the month of May. There was three fallen sure. officers on the month of May that I want to take note of, and uh, I'm actually at the Officer Down Memorial page right now, and I just want to read off um, the three officers, so just bear with me. Uh, the first officer is Deputy Sheriff Mark Burbridge. He's from the Potawatomi County Sheriff's Office in Iowa. Uh, he was 43 years old. He had a tour that was 12 years. Uh, and it's a sad story to him. Deputy Sheriff Mark um, Burbridge was shot and killed at the Potawatomi County Jail in uh, Council Bluffs as he and another deputy returned two inmates to the jail after a court appearance. As the deputies began to take the inmates into the jail, one of the inmates attacked them. The inmate was able to disarm one of the deputies and shot them both. He then stole the transport van and fled from the jail. He shot a citizen nearby when he attempted to carjack the man. He then abducted another citizen and forced her to drive him from the scene to her vehicle. The subject was located by Omaha, Nebraska police officers after releasing the women. He was taken into custody following a high-speed pursuit and charged with numerous felonies related to the carjacking and weapon possession. The man had just been sentenced to 55 years in prison after pleading guilty to murder. Uh, Deputy Burbridge had served with the Potawatomi County Sheriff's Office for 12 years. So just real quickly, a moment of silence for Deputy Sheriff Mark Burbridge. Okay. Um, the next officer I would like to mention is Deputy Sheriff Jimmy Tennyson. Uh, Deputy Sheriff Jimmy Tennyson was from Maury County Sheriff's Department, Tennessee. His end of watch was Saturday, May 6, 2017. Deputy Sheriff Jimmy Tennyson succumbed to injuries sustained in a single vehicle crash the previous morning at approximately 7.30 a.m. He was en route to a local high school when his patrol car left the roadway on Iron Bridge Road near Running Deer Drive in Columbia. The vehicle went down an embankment and struck a group of trees. He was transported to a local hospital before being transferred to Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He succumbed to his injuries on May 6, 2017. Deputy Tennyson had served in law enforcement for 30 years and was assigned as a school resource officer. He's survived by his wife, children, and grandchildren. Again, a moment of silence for Deputy Sheriff Jimmy Tennyson. Okay, a turkey man on my toes and... Okay, moving forward. Uh, one more officer I would like to mention, please. His name is uh, he's police officer Jonathan Ginka from Norton Shores Police Department, Michigan. His end of watch was Wednesday, May 10, 2017. Okay. Uh, that's today, uh, the day we're filming this. Police officer John Ginka was killed in a single vehicle crash on Henry Street south of Ross Road shortly after 2.30 a.m. His patrol SUV left the roadway and struck a tree, causing extensive damage. He was extricated from the vehicle and transported to a local hospital where he succumbed to his injuries a short time later. Officer Ginka had served with the Norton Shore Police Department for 10 years. He survived by his wife and two children. Again, a moment of silence for police officer Jonathan Ginka. And again, thank you for your service. And as always, we have your watch from here. And again, yeah. for the families out there, you do not share this burden alone. No, no. And we, we never forget our, our brothers and sisters in blue who, who made the ultimate sacrifice. This week is Police Week in Washington, D.C., where, where our brothers and sisters uh, congregate and, and celebrate the lives of the lost. And we, don't, we never forget about our, our family members in blue, uh, whether they're wearing a uh, corrections uniform, police, a, 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 a patrol uniform, 
or any other uniform, we're, you know, we are uh, honorable, um, and we have badges of honor, and we maintain that. Right, and, and again, just happy, uh, it is law enforcement week, happy correctional week. Um, if anybody's going out to Washington this weekend, I wish yeah. I could go. Yeah, I'm going. You're going, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll be leaving Friday. Check out the, uh, the FOPs having a vendor tent. We'll have our body vegans there, and, and please check in with us. We'd love to see you. I, I fortunately, I would love to go, but unfortunately, um, it's tougher for me to go. I have a four-month-old and a four-year-old. How old are your children now? Uh, my kids are 18, 15, 12, and 7. Also, Matt retired, right? Yeah, I retired three and a half years ago from, from the uh, law enforcement, and now I'm a civilian director at Montclair State University Police as the emergency management uh, director. Right now, now guys, I want to start the show real quick. Uh, again, it may not be the most important bit of news today, uh, but I, I got to bring this up because it's upsetting me. All right, there was a guy by the name of Trevor Brooks. I want, I want to read this. Uh, this is very upsetting to me, um, I, I, uh, and I'll explain why, but I think, again, for those that don't know our field and, and don't know how easily what looks like good intention uh, may have like an ulterior motive to it. Trevor Brooks is the founder for Guns for Bail. Uh, is anybody familiar with um, Guns for Bail? Uh, Guns for Bail is basically. Uh, he, he, let me just let me just explain how this um, this oh, works. Philosophy. Uh, yeah, it, it's it, well, well. First of all, it's it's not so much a, a unique. It's not so much a unique idea. I mean, it's been done before. Uh, but basically, in this case here, what Trevor Brooks is doing is he wants people to turn in their guns, and then the guns could be used um, to post bail. Correct. Now, here's the catch. Here's the catch with this. The guns that are turned in cannot be investigated to connecting crimes. So let me get your opinion on that, Raffer. I mean, what's your idea of this guns for bail? Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. And, and also, you're actually going to encourage importing of other guns um, because now the criminal element will want to buy and purchase additional guns, stash them, so when they do get arrested, they turn in the guns they don't want and they'll enhance their, their weaponry by buying new and improved guns. Um, also, a homicide and, and gun crimes, homicide specifically, there is no statute of limitations. So with that said, if a weapon, a firearm is used in a homicide, then you won't have that piece of evidence, which is a key component uh, of evidence, uh, ballistically, uh, and forensic DNA evidence, touch DNA evidence, to get from a firearm, including the fire pin strikes and, and the casing striations and so forth. So a, a lot of investigation goes into the actual firearm in a homicide, you know, in firearm related homicides. So you're giving the criminal element an opportunity to get rid of a purposeful a piece, of evidence. piece of evidence. Oh, an incredible piece of evidence. And 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 to do so and, and the collaboration of knuckleheads will begin. So somebody who's wanted for a murder has a weapon they use, they'll give it to some one of their cohorts yeah. who in criminal element and turn in this gun because now I know it's in the system, won't come back to me, and you get out of bail. Well, that's my, that's my word. And guys, just so you know, we're not making this up. The article comes from the Baltimore Sun. Right at the very beginning, it says, Trevor Brooks, a convicted murderer who attended Silicon Valley ent uh, Entrepreneurship Program after getting out of prison, has an idea he thinks could reduce the rate of gun violence in Baltimore. Let people use an app to turn in guns and make bail. Okay, now, again, the reason why I have an issue with this, again, it's not about his past. If you're looking to help the community, get the guns off the streets, I respect that. I really do. You know, it, it's not I me. Mean, look at the shootings going on in Chicago. Yeah, but interesting you know? if he was convicted based on a gun evidence. Well, that, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where, you know. Oh, but again, if, if the intent was good. Oh, we got our food coming, guys. Hold on. Uh, no, I don't have to come. I'll keep going. No, but I, I want to see my oh, Mexican yeah. wrap. Oh, nice. It's, it's and the lamb. Oh, it is hot. Thank you. Oh, oh, I spilled okay. the water. That was me, guys. I spilled the water, but we have loving people here who are willing to help us at Six Brothers. I spilled water because I got excited to see my wrap. Thank you. What is that, like a lamb stew? Leave my lamb out of this, bro. Yeah, like you, a lamb you stew. the catastrophic incidents. So here's mm -hmm. our plates. That's the five brothers. That's my uh, uh, Mexican record, wrap. Anthony Ganji is the one causing the problems here. I spilled the water <laughs> at the table. But again, Anthony Ganji. we had some beautiful people helping us out. Can thank, I, you. thank you, and I apologize for Matt. Okay. Uh, okay. So real quick, sorry, I had a problem. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So so real quick, and that's not going to edit out. We do things live. Um, okay, guys. So real quick, 
if the intent was to help individuals, which which I understand, then you know, let's get the guns off the street. But it's that stipulation. If you read a little further, okay, as you progress through the article, guys, I did post the article on my page on the Tear Talk page. If you read through the article, okay. It says, once the gun was surrendered to authorities, the courts would agree to release the inmate on their own reconnaissance, and law enforcement would agree not to investigate whether the gun had been used in any other crime. So my thing is, if you really want to help, why is that stipulation even in there? Help his friends out. Who are you really helping out, Trevor? You, Trevor, come on, Trevor. We're not that stupid. Yeah, I mean, guys, and for this to be considered, um, I'm well, sorry, guys. Let's the, let's, the gun buyback system, that, that works to a certain area. I, I participated during my career in a gun buyback. And, and during those, those gun buybacks, people turn in guns that don't work, or they turn in really old shotguns and they get and maximize their, their amount of money uh, that they get from guns they don't want at home, which is good. That actually increases child safety. There's children in the home, the gun's not there anymore, and increases their safety at home. I'm all about that, and that's fine. Um, but very few assault weapons did get turned in, but if they do get turned in, again, they have to get investigated. You, you know, if it's involved in a homicide, if someone took someone else's life, then you need to investigate to the furthest extent of the law. And, and having a stipulation that you can't investigate a piece of evidence is ridiculous. And it's also criminal, you know, and, and I, I, that's going nowhere. And right. Baltimore has a major issue, first and foremost. I admit it, well, the prosecutor's law, the district attorney's a nightmare, where she, she quickly indicted those, those officers, right? right. And, and, and that was premature, and she, she's ultimately still paying that price. Um, and thank God those officers were, were found not guilty and, and some charges were even dropped based on the ridiculousness of that. With that, that and then didn't she wind up having a connection with uh, a convicted felon? She should, of course. So another classic moment in Baltimore. And it's not, it's not like they don't have enough to do in Baltimore. Those cops have their hands full yeah. with violent crimes, gangs, and, and not only just in the inner city, but they're also at the connection of Washington and so forth. And, and you know, it's a great city. Uh, the Inner Harbor is beautiful. Great people are still trapped by knuckleheads. So what Baltimore City, our hat comes, you know, Baltimore City Police Department uh, and the surrounding agencies, you know, Prince George, uh, you guys are phenomenal, ladies are phenomenal, doing a great job. Um, but we, we can't ignore firearm evidence because a knucklehead wants to get out of jail. Right, and the thing is, the fact that it, it's being even entertained, my concern is where's the justice for the victims that would be connected to the uh, or the victim's family. So I mean, so who are they to make that decision that, you know what, you can bail yourself out and then we won't worry about the victims who may be connected to that uh, weapon. Like, like who, who are they to make that decision? You know, where, where's the justice for the victims? Right, well, that's gonna, it's insulting. first of all, a city council person, in all due respect, they represent the people, but they can't change judiciary law, nor can they, they, can, they can recommend like, I really hope you can do this, but they don't have the authority to, to change legislation or even to authorize anything of, of ignoring evidence. And, and on a state level, federal level, and that's something else we didn't even cover yet. What about the federal statutes? What if a crime was committed in a different state? Can I yeah, so you? That, wait, but hold on. That's a great question, man. That's why you're on the show. That's what Look I'm what stuck. you just said. Hey, Trevor, let me ask you a question. Whoever you're... Trevor, where are you at, Trevor? Yeah, I don't know if Trevor's even listening to the show, but... Trevor, if the if the weapons used in another state, if that person gets arrested in a different state, who is that state to say? Guess what? Unless they're trying to make this a federal law, never happens. Or a federal uh, bill or guideline, whatever you want to call it. That's ridiculous. It, it defies common sense. That was a good point, man. Thank you. I didn't think about that. I, I did think about this though, because I do work on the other side of things. I did think about this. Now imagine if I did commit a crime, right? So so let's say this. Maybe I will commit a low level crime. Just so someone can bring a weapon that's attached to a bigger crime, of course. and then we go ahead so, and I mean, we go ahead and throw we collaborated. away. Collaborated. So even I'll go one step further. Yeah. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms are exposed to ATF, E now, whatever they want to call themselves. ATF has a huge responsibility about identifying firearms and tracking the firearms. The key word is tracking the firearms. Illegal firearms are purchased in different states, cross state lines, and defy state state laws. How are they going to accomplish that if, if that evidence, it, there's no way to track it because you don't have to use it. So it makes no sense. So Trevor, good idea, turn in your guns. I'm all about that. If you're an illegal, uh, if you're using weapons illegally, turn them all in. Turn yourself in too. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm gonna say something just on this side there alone. Trevor, you have a motive. Sorry, got a Trevor Brooks got a motive. You know, I mean, and, and for anybody even come close to entertaining this idea, all I'm gonna put out is there, where's the justice for the victims? 
Well, Where's the justice for the victims? Right. And, and again, it's evidence. When do we turn a blind eye to evidence? And you that's know? what it makes it seem like we're doing. Of course it is. I mean, these are guns that are going to be connected to murders. I mean, you could, you can't even imagine. And that's another thing. You don't even know when you get the gun, what's it even connected? What are you throwing out? Well, you don't even know. You well, know what I mean? What if it's my gun? What if you're a knucklehead, Anthony, which you're not, which is covered up? Well, uh, that's all right. It's fine. All right. Sometimes. Let's just I say just, he steals my, my gun at home. What if you steal my gun at home? Right? Now, you turn in my gun. That's you another can't, you can't You can't use a gun, which is now possession of stolen property against whoever stole my gun? Yeah, because obviously you have to check to see who if that gun belongs stolen, to. Right? Is, is it course. yours? You know, you don't know who that gun belongs to. I have a right to my own property. And, and you know, you know me, Anthony, I've been on the show many times. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, you know, right to bear arms, I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Everyone should have a gun. That's my opinion. You know, I was a SWAT guy for 12 and a half years. Never took a... Never arrested anybody who had a lawful gun in their possession. Not a single person. Unlawful all day long. Lawful, not so much. Right. So, so the, the point is, yeah, if you have a gun, God bless it. Make sure you use it, you train with it, you know how to you know, adapt it, know how to reload it, keep it safe from your kids. I get it. Be responsible. However, if you're going to commit a crime, all right, and you're in jail, oh, what do I do now? How do I oh, bail myself out? How do I bail myself I know. Hey, mom or grandma. Go in the basement and get the gun that you know that my buddy killed somebody with, and turn it in for me because I want to get out of here. And it's almost as bad as New Jersey bail reform right now. We're okay. letting everybody loose. You know, and and I, I want to also say, check this out. Um, you know, we had the Alton Sterling case recently, and they found the officers not to be guilty. And I'm sure there'll be a civil lawsuit eventually on this. You know, you you, you know that. Um, but today, lawmakers. Um, are trying to pass a bill, I believe, in uh, Louisiana, or they did, I'm sorry, Louisiana House passes the, Alto, the Alton Sterling bill, which would deny due process to police officers. Okay, now check this out. If you're not familiar with this, everybody's familiar with the Alton um, Sterling case, correct? Right by the vehicle. Uh, he's resisting. You can see he's resisting. And then the officers, after telling him multiple times, stop moving, stop moving. Um, they do shoot him, but then they're able to see that the, the guy did have a gun. He had a gun inside his pocket. Um, clear as day. So again, you know, the guy's resisting arrest. He's still posing a threat. He's still moving. And he's armed. armed. And he's armed. And all he had to do was stop. And don't forget, when these officers were called to the scene, they were called to the scene because he was armed. You know, he's selling CDs and he was uh, brandishing a weapon. Now, these are the two bills that are being passed by uh, the state of Louisiana, Baton Rouge. Two bills that were introduced in response to the Alton Sterling shooting have passed the Louisiana House. Now, this, this comes from Blue Lives Matter, Warren Police. And it says both bills are blatantly unfair to police officers and deny them due process. So, according to WBRZ, the first bill, introduced by Baton Rouge Representative Ted James, passed by a vote of 102 to 0. 102 to 0. Where are the Republicans on this one? Just hypothetically. It is what it is. I'm sorry. In that bill, the amount of time that a police officer has to hire an attorney after an incident of an officer-involved shooting or injury was reduced from 30 days to 14 days, with some exceptions. And the second part is the House also voted to pass a related bill by a vote of 97 to 0. In that bill, a council would have the ability to revoke the certification of a suspended or discharged officer. So right now with the way politics are, let me ask you a question, Matt, because, again, I refer to Bill. But right now the way our environment is, you know, and I believe, you know, we're, we're in a bit of a war here. You know what I mean? Some people look to... Uh, appease the community right away without actually talking to the officers first to see what happened. How quick do you see the suspensions coming right away? Because we see that right now, and then now you're going to revoke the certification. <clears throat> right. You, you got to take a step back. <coughs> Every state's unique. In New Jersey, I was on a shooting response team in Passaic County. Also involved in a shooting is on administrative leave. He's not suspended. Automatic. Automatically. Administrative leave. What that means is, doesn't mean he's de-gunned. That means that he's, he, he is at home. He's immediately, the investigation has to occur. Now, he is compelled. Now, 99.9% .9 in New Jersey, police officer involved shootings, the officer responds to the hospital based on the, the emotional traumatic incident that he's been encountered, and he'll be medicated at the hospital. Since the officer is medicated, he loses the at the investigators do not have access to him, nor will they question him about what transpired. The scene gets processed, witnesses get located, and, and the investigation is initiated. 
Um, his weapon is taken from him, and is, you know, obviously, they count the number of rounds that he fired to make sure it corresponds with the amount of rounds in his magazine. Let me ask you a question before you can sure. start. So when, sure. when the weapon gets taken, obviously that's standard protocol. Does the media always say that though right away? Like when they say, oh, well, his weapon was taken away, they make it look like his weapon was taken away because he did something wrong right off the bat. Because you got to demonize the police. That's how you get more rated. Right. So technically the weapon's being taken away because it's <laughs> protocol after an officer, an OIS, an officer involved shooting. Absolutely. Because you have to make sure the officer, you got to make sure the weapon didn't misfire also. So keep in mind, you also may have discharged a weapon, but maybe the weapon fired a second or third time because it was um, a structurally wrong or, or, or spring. We are they right. investigated. I think we're perfect. Yeah, hey, thank, thank you. you. So the, the weapon gets investigated, rounds that get fired, the casings get investigated to match it with the firearm. We want to make sure there wasn't a, a mysterious second weapon involved or a second officer involved in the shooting. Also, the, the round itself, if it's in the body or in a in a person in a tree in a house that gets recovered and make sure it matches the weapon that was fired all right so let, let's just go with the first part of this new law now so in louisiana in louisiana guys in louisiana which it seemed to have passed unanimously which is right. crazy <clears throat> i would at least expect that a few votes for the other side but it is what it is it's the climate um when it when it talked about the, the first half of the law talks about the um, need for a lawyer from 30 to 14 days that, that, that could be tough on somebody, right? I mean, to get the lawyer right away. I mean, I, I don't have to deal with a lawyer right now. Well, in Jersey's different. Well, yeah, your neighbor's a lawyer. Everybody's a lawyer. But keep in mind, unions, in, nationally, unions, the, the FOP union, Fraternal Order of Police, the PBAs, uh, larger organizations already have attorneys um, on standby. They pay them a certain fee so that they're available 24-7. Casey Ulster does get involved in a shooting. That he needs representation and does that he or administrative he, inclination if there's an administrative investigation they have he, or does he automatically get that lawyer even if the circumstances may be questionable yes okay good so okay so some states obviously in this case louisiana are, are we thinking that they're not provided with a lawyer well I don't, I don't know i can't i can't now other states are at will states so other states means that they can hire you fire fire you at will they, they new jersey is unique well, not, well, in this area, it's not unique, but in a broad sense, it is because you have to pretty much commit a felony to get fired here. There could be administrative means of getting fired, but there's unions that, that are very strong here to, to keep you on the job. Down south, not so much. Down south, they don't they don't need a reason to fire you. You can walk in and say, you know what, Anthony, you're doing a great job, but we need you to hand in your gun and badge. You're done today, and and that's the extent of it. So. So being an at-will employee, you're, you're, you're working at the will of the employer. So it's a lot easier to suspend and also to terminate employees uh, in different states than it is in the northern region. Right, and what about that, that second half of that law, the law that, um, just want to make sure I read it correctly. Sure. The second half that says that um, once the officer gets the, um, revoked or, I'm sorry, gets suspended or discharged, they have the, the house has the right to go ahead and revoke the um, a council, I'm sorry, would have the right to revoke the certification of the officer once they're suspended or discharged. Well, and that's where judge, jury, and prosecutor, you know, and, and it all comes into play now. Well, if he's suspended, that means he's got to be guilty. And that's and not always the case. That's not always the case, no. So is there, let me ask you a question. Well, so look at Ferguson. Perfect example. Yeah, yeah. Ferguson, Missouri. Right? False narrative. From day one to, to the very next second. Hands up, don't shoot. Complete nonsense. Bullshit across the line. And everyone took it and ran with it. The media sensationalized it. They made shirts. A couple of idiots made millions on it. And, and it is what it is. Because, oh, because it fits the narrative. It fits the social climate at the time. The common enemy. If you want to get a group of people together, have a common enemy. And, that right, was that's what, yeah, that's and it still is. And we're still feeling the consequences of that. So, so and that officer's life as a police officer is, is ruined. No one thinks of him. Well, you know, you know, it's funny. I'm actually reading a book right now by... Um, Jeff Peaks, Peaks, uh, he's a correspondent uh, for CBS News. He does like homeland law enforcement issues. The book is called Black and Blue. Um, it's a book that really is about the relationship between um, the black community and, and law enforcement. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. You're never gonna find a true objective book on this topic, it's the truth, I'm sorry, it is what it is. You're never really gonna find a book that really represents both sides equally. It's hard to, I'm telling you, because there's no one on our side of the table to write it. 
because they're yeah. afraid well, that no, maybe no one's written it yet. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I say, but right now, yeah, right. Uh, it's hard to find. So in the meantime, the reason why, again, the book's okay. It, it, it really does. You could tell the guy researched his topics. He talks about talks about a lot of Chicago incidences because I think he focuses on the Laquan McDonald shooting uh, in 2014. Chirac, right? Yeah, yeah. Chirac, Chirac. is nuts. Uh, well, that's Chicago. Yeah, well, um, in a general sense of terms. Another, the tightest gun rules on the planet. The gun laws on the planet in Chicago, you know, extraordinary. Why? It doesn't make a difference. So. It doesn't. But, but what I'm saying is, in this case here, is that the beginning of the book focuses on about 50%. 50% through. Beginner focuses on the Laquan McDonald shooting, you know, the delay in releasing the video, uh, the mistrust that the community has for um, the police because of, you know, these incidences. Um, and then also, it also talks about, uh, it, it touches on San Francisco too, which uh, I guess had a, uh, a history of uh, what, what he deems as being racism. Again, I find the book to be very good and I'll tell you why. Again, it, it's, 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 it's one of the better ones I've read, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because even though he's going to touch on topics that are more geared towards the community's perspective, all he did was put the simple line in, it's not every officer. Right. And I thought when someone says that, you know what, man, the fact that he's willing to put that in makes me willing to read it. It gives me a chance to say, let's see what this problem is. Let's, let's try to make an effort to understand what the issue is. But the fact is that he was willing to put that simple statement in made me open to hear what the other side is. And I have a feeling right now, with the way politics is going, it's the extreme left, the extreme right, and no one's gonna start off a conversation with, hey, it's uh, it's only this one officer who's a bad seat, it's every officer. Right. And that's where it makes <laughs> us resistant to any type of communication that may be beneficial to both sides. Right. Well, and that's where you get racists calling other officers racist based on their skin. It, it, to me, it, the, you're, 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 Ridiculous. You're, you're, you're calling yourself out, I'll be honest with you. So, majority of my career was in urban environments and, and, and had strong African American communities, strong Latino communities. Um, actually, at one time, I was the only white guy in my shift. It was the best time in my whole, in my whole career. Because I grew up in white America. I grew up in Bergen County and we had one one single black African American family who was legitimately African American, by the way. Um, he he he's from Niger, and he was Af Dad was African, and Mom was American. And Clem and, and uh, his brother oh, lived in my backyard. We played football together. He, he destroyed me every time. He was huge. But anyway, <clears throat> Clem, I hope you're out there. I hope you hear me. And call me if you, if you hear Clem Darty. So Kofi is with his brother. K O F I. So make a long story longer, I thought, you know, hanging out with Clem, I didn't, I didn't really, you know, obviously I knew the difference. He, you know, he was a black kid and I was a white kid. And there were some, some comments that were made, you know, throughout his childhood, obviously, because he was the only black kid in the class. But I had no appreciation whatsoever of the judgment that, that people live through based on their skin color. Right. Um, until I went into, the, into their community and, and I was the minority. And I was assumed to be rich. I was assumed to have everything I ever wanted and have a perfect family because I was white. Um, and also, the culture, the whole different. aspect of culture is completely different to the, to the fact where, you know, it, it's completely different to the point of me not realizing that it's different than the same. Everybody loves their family. Everybody loves their family. Given the opportunity, people will strive. Taken away from the opportunity, people get frustrated. And it's as simple as that. What you do with that frustration makes a big difference, obviously. Well, I think that's where, like, even when you had the Ferguson issues, you had, uh, I mean, at least what, what the book says, is you have this tension already. That's why when you had the protest, they figured, well, it blew up in Missouri, but it may not have blown up in other areas because there was already this undercurrent of what the community saw as um, being fair, uh, unfairly treated. But having said that. What's a volcano? That's way it's all right. Occasionally, but then you have the bigger <coughs> Right, and, and, and the thing is, what I, what, I, what I thought was okay with this book, again, I'm only 50% through, and I would love to have Jeff Peegs on the show just to really get a good perspective out there, is even though it, it, you know, it, it may come off one side, it, it does to some extent. I mean, I know he's got his, it's his book. He's got a goal in mind. He's going to write that goal. I can't fault him for that. You know, I mean, if I wrote a book, it may be a little different as well. Uh, but having said that, there is an attempt from him to get to a middle ground. 
you know? And I don't think they're, I don't think people are trying that. So the moment he started off by complimenting both sides, usually when you read a book, they don't do that. They, 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 they uh, pick on the one side to get their point across. This was fair. Like I thought that if people were to read it, I think by just saying, hey, it's not every officer, it opens up, yeah, you know what, they're right. You know, it's not every officer. So when I'm reading it, what, what's good is it sets this tone where now when I'm reading it, I'm only focusing on the officer that may have done something foolish that Correct. cannot be justified uh, by his department. Right. Well, you can do a thousand things right and do one thing wrong, and that's what they're going to remember. Right. So just keep, keep that in mind also. But you got to remember the quality of the wrong. Oh, I, I, I completely understand it. And also the, 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 the disconnect. So, I, I, hey, listen, I was a guy in the inner city jumping out of cars, pointing guns at people, and then telling people, get on the ground, get on the ground, because we had a, a call, black male, blue jeans, white t-shirt, wearing Timberlands. All right, that's about 80% of the population at that very moment. And, and about 20 guys were on that corner where it fit in that description. So what do you do? I gotta go home at night. I got four beautiful kids and a hot wife. I gotta get home. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of the car, I'm gonna go to guns, prone everybody out. Is that the meaning? 100%. 100% the meaning, yes. Am I in control of you? Yes. Did you like giving up control of your freedom? Absolutely not. Is it necessary? Yes. And the problem comes, the problem comes is after the, the individuals are pat down and, and it, the scene has become safe at that point, there's no weapons on the individuals, <clears throat> is the follow up. Hey, listen guys, this is why I did what I did. And this is why I had to do what I had to do. And there's 20 of you, and there's only two, my, myself and my partner, we have to take everybody at gunpoint. Somebody's out here with a gun, so be careful. Right. And this is why we're here. That, 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 sometimes that doesn't happen. A lot of times that doesn't happen in inner cities for a variety of different reasons. A, they gotta go to the next job. They're, they're too busy to explain themselves. Or B, they don't care. <laughs> Enough's enough, and you get the attitude of, of you know how they are, or those people, and we, you know, when people start doing this stuff, and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, oh, watch out for the animals, you know how they act. These are racist comments. There's well, no they, is a, they is a separating word, or automatically, uh, you know, the word them. Sometimes I know there are some departments that actually see those words, uh, and those words can be used against them. You know, of course. And and, 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 and the problem is, is that uh, that could be something that people don't realize they're doing. That's how embedded that that could come out. You know, like right. you may not necessarily mean that, but it's how right. the public perceives. What you're saying. Well, perception's reality. Yes. It's your own reality. So your perception and my perception is completely different, but all realities are different, but the situation is still the same. So how do we translate that? How do, how do I explain to you what my perception is? And, and the key is, I don't know, communication. Hey, listen, Anthony, I had to take you at gunpoint. Let me brush, brush you off and be careful because somebody's got a gun out here. Um, so, but after a while, it gets old. It does. You know, when, when you get pointed, guns get pointed at you, or, or you get a record check for walking down the street, or or you get looked on the side of your eye like you're, you're less of a human being, then that's an issue. Or even if you do get locked up, right, and you get treated uh, inhumanely, you know, get called names, get, you can go through that a process. That could throw away a whole case. Oh, my goodness. You know, because and, the civil rights of the person but, but being violated. But, but the point is, on a human level, you know what? I catch you dirty, you're dirty. You're going in, right? You're a shit up, you're going to go to jail, shit up. I get it. We'll process you and carry on. But, but the name calling, the antagonizing nonsense, that comes to an end. How you want, you put your hands on the police, you, you gotta expect to get hit back if you wanna swing at the police. And that's another like, oh, I can't believe the police hit them. Absolutely. The police have an absolute right to defend themselves, but also they have to affect a lawful arrest. So whether to stop, if I stopped you from panhandling or I stopped you for an armed robbery, you still have the right, you need to stop. And your non-compliance will inflict your, your issues. Yeah, because the thing is, uh, and again, just to the uninformed here, the non-compliance means that the threat's still not eliminated. So the officer's still, I mean, just imagine this. Let me just paint a scenario here. You're an officer, you're getting called to the scene because there's a guy that has a weapon. Someone called you, you know, you, you someone calls, uh, whatever, the 911 dispatch, and they send you out saying, hey, be advised, we just notified someone's in the neighborhood. Uh, this is what the individual looks like, and he's carrying a, a gun. So now when the officer gets to that scene, He's ready, you know, he, he's preparing himself, he's ready. Uh, but when he engages the, the threat, and that threat is not listening, th this officer in the back of his mind is like, is he gonna pull that gun out? Is he, you know? And then the problem here with after the fact is that, is that like we had an incident recently, I, I think it was in Texas, forgive me, but it may have been Texas with the BB gun, with the, uh, the this kid uh, was called, called the cops to the scene saying that there was, uh, he basically wanted to commit suicide. 
So when the the cops came to the scene, the kid threw out uh, threw uh, out a BB gun. The cop killed him. Right? Again, they found a suicide note uh, on his person. So you could tell the kid wanted to die. But having said that, let's just say hypothetically. Um, they didn't have that attached suicide note, and you really didn't know um, that this kid wanted to die. It's justified. It, yeah, I agree. But the problem is, is the public will get the information later and say, oh my God, it was a BB gun. You shot him and he had a BB gun. Yeah, but the officer did not know that. So we have to start, and again, this is to the public here. Guys, you got to start putting your mind frame in the officer who was going through the moment at that time, living and breathing it. And then you have to realize what's going through his head. Was he called to the scene? What was he told when he comes to the scene? It's when the person's not listening, like, Put up your hands. You're not yes. putting up your hands. Yeah. Put up your hands. You're not the, putting up your yeah. hands. Totality of the circumstance. Yeah, because it, it, let me ask you a question. If 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 you don't know anything about me, you know, and I, I'm approaching you and I'm telling you, hey, my man, just listen to me. I, I, we can talk, but you're still a threat to me. Lower your. Uh, I'm sorry. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. I just need to see your hands. Your hands are the most e dangerous e things. Even simpler than that, I, I have rolled around with shitums, and shitums. Anybody who wants to hurt me, by the way, and who's getting locked up. That's what a shitum is. And they they come across all races and religions and Sorry, creeds. I'm just, we, we know. No, I'm just letting you know what a shit them is. So panhandler, people get a phone call. The guy keeps asking him for money. You know he's stinking up the the location that he's at. He's homeless. Smells like ass. He's got to get out of here. We get there. I oh, mean, you got to go. Tells you go go pound yeah. salt. Yeah. Right? Drops the f bomb. Go after yourself. All right, let's go. You're leaving. I mean, if, if I tell you one more time, you're gonna get locked up. And you escort him out out the building. He pulls his arm back, right? Now he's gotta go. Now, he, and now here comes the struggle. Let me see your ID. I'm not giving you anything. I didn't do anything wrong. Give me your ID. I'm conducting an investigation. You're panhandling. Now you're defying trespassing. Give me your ID. F you. Now it's on. Now you're rolling around the guy, right? Bear with me. You're going for his hands. He's making a fist swing at you. You hit him. Boom. Break the guy's jaw, right? You swing at you. You give a good shot to him. He should have drank some more milk, maybe. Break hit him in the jaw. Breaks his jaw. We lock him up. Now the guy's twisted, right? Looks like a bad Ken doll because his jaw's shifted. And, and then all of a sudden, oh, well, what color was the officer? Yeah, I noticed that. And that's nonsense. Yeah, it it's is. what it is. And, and also, and even not for black officers, automatically they're assuming that they're, they're under some type of turmoil with decision to make as police officers. They're not under turmoil. They are sworn police officers. They're doing what they need to get done based on policy right. and procedure. The bottom line is this. The pigment in your skin has nothing to do with the decisions you make. I'm sorry. No, no, no I excuses. agree. excuses. You know what? Your training and your expertise will take you to a level where you need to make good decisions, educate decisions, and decisions that are going to save your life. And my brothers in blue, again, from... from any any culture, I don't care what they NYPD has every any culture, the cop's a cop, he's gonna make decisions based on what he sees, his perception and a threat against him. Not the pigment in his skin. Because no one really cares about the pigment in your skin. And also, if I engage you in any situation, again, you said the same thing. Hands. You know, I I I'm, I'm one of the instructors of the police academy. No one's ever been shot by anyone else using their feet. If I don't see your hands, you're in instantaneous danger. And that has to be addressed. And if you're non-compliant, that's an indication or a red flag that you may be wanting to kill me. Right. And I don't know you. And, and, and the level of training you have, I don't know. And I agree. I just want to add something to that. Like, I, I actually had Michael Wolford on my show. We discussed use of force. And he's basically, yeah, he's awesome. Michael Wolford's awesome. And he talked about a few things that the public may not be aware of, which is one thing, it only takes an eighth of a second to pull a weapon out. You know, that's one thing, you know, and get the shot off. And the other thing is... This was crazy. The twenty-four, the twenty-one foot rule. And I, I had a gun pointed on him. He had a knife, and I could not get the shot off before he stabbed me. And he was twenty-one feet away. And people were looking at me like, "That's not no, that's real." No. Because and, I couldn't get the shot off. Right. And I was a SWAT operator, and, and we had knife, uh, our edge weapon defense and edge weapon offense. So extraordinary. I'd rather go against somebody with a gun than somebody who knows what they're doing with a knife. No joke. Yeah. It's extraordinary the amount of damage that can be done. And, 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 and I'm going I'm to tell you something. When, when I was actually had a chance to talk to Mike, um, I, I learned, like, you know, you're living, you're breathing the moment. Um, there's hesitation involved, but it's the hands. If those hands cannot be seen, the person that's not listening is putting himself in there. That's what I want to talk about. It's not that the officer wanted to shoot him. The officer is reacting because the person is not complying. He's not putting his hands and, up. And, and let's cover that real quick too, young people. All right, this is gonna bring a whole new topic up here and I gotta bring it up. Respect, respect. They're learning from their parents that they can, they can, they can absolutely disrespect the police and it's okay. 
And, that's and, and it's incorrect. And it's not okay. And you can't threaten your kids with the police. Oh, wait till, well, when the police come, they're going to take you away. That's, that's nonsense. Yeah, because it automatically sets the divide. And that's, you know what, and, and if you read the book, The, the Black and Blue, uh, it actually talks about what you just said. It, it, they're setting the divide. Like, you know, fear the police, not respect them. You know, and, and that's the problem. Like, like they, they, there has to be a mutual ground. But again, just to kind of elaborate, the respect does got to be given both ways. So when we deal with this, remember, if there's an incident, before we're quick to damn the department, know for a fact that there's a lot of interactions that are positive that are not being shown. It just happens to be we're highlighting the one negative, and now sure. this becomes the way of generalizing the professional field. But, but the reason why I get myself in the situation where I, I get frustrated is because I consider myself professional, you consider yourself professional, I don't want to be stereotyped towards the negative. I want people to know that I've done my job. So the reason why we get upset is that the one officer that does make a bad choice, right, does something foolish, now automatically <clears throat> we all fall in that boat. Right. And now all of a sudden we have this animosity based well, on, wait, 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 wait based I on the media though. Yeah, but, but, yeah, I agree, but I want to base, I have a, a thought here is we have an animosity based on a false belief of what they think we are because they're judging us based on the minority action. You know, the action of that one officer who did something foolish. But having said that, I just want to also add something, is that there is a history, and we know that. But the only way we're going to overcome that history is if we find that respect for each other for the roles that we play. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you something. You're talking about black history? Well, no, I'm talking about just the overall history of police and policing in black communities. Let me, let me jump know, that. back from the civil rights. With yeah, the, no, let's talk about Eugene that. And, 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 and black history is American history, by the yeah, way. Yeah, of course. It, it, but that makes me nuts that we have a black history month. We have, that it's part of American history. I hate the division of anything. It really makes me nuts. Nonetheless, when I say... The bottom line is this: our our federal government tried to keep all the African American people in the projects. It was it was it was Wrong. all the way to the president. That's our history. Yeah. I get it. You get it. The black community lives it, and generationally has lived it. And and also, there's been certain processes put in place that not stop them from succeeding, but makes it a little bit harder because why you know. Of doing anything for anyone, so after a while you get lazy and complacent. You don't do anything, and that comes generational. And if I get a check in, in, a, in a, once a month, I'm not to do anything, and I, I don't take myself to a different level, and I don't raise my generations that my kids will have a better life than I had. You know, <clears throat> but with that said, we acknowledge that in law enforcement, we understand that the federal that that the system was made to to to, um, to target them for lack of better words at a certain at a certain process in their lives. But we're beyond that now. We are so beyond that, it makes me crazy. And every time there's any type of racial issue, they automatically want to bring up race as opposed to the consequence or these personal actions of the individual who caused the event. Like for the police officer who got called to, to the, a man with a gun. The police officer did not go walk down the street, oh, let's pick, let's pick that black guy and roll around with him that that. No one, first of all, no one plans to kill anybody in law enforcement. And that makes me nothing even more crazier. We make good money. And, and, and some police officers, in this part of the country, we make an exceptional amount of money. About a police officer makes about $100,000 a year, which is higher than anywhere else in other countries. And, and some of you just might get mad at me for saying it, but it's okay. We make a lot of money. We are not willing to give our pensions and our lives and our freedom to go kill some random person who doesn't look like us. Yeah, but remember now, again, there, we, again, we try to do things objectively and just playing devil's advocate. No, I'm just simply telling you. Before we, there's a thought process. Oh, right, I, we I can't agree, but we shoot do, somebody. It's but we have to also say, again, the argument would be here just to get to both sides is that we do have some that do foolish things. You know, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, because they do foolish things, it puts a negative shine on all of us who do what we're supposed to do every day, who risk our lives for uh, the public. And when I mean the public, I mean everyone. Oh, you know, no but 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 there is something that you said that I do want to mention and, and I agree with is the fact that we do have to start holding individuals responsible and stop going to the automatic default that it's a racial thing. You know, I agree with that. You know, we have to look at the instance and say, wait a second, before you say it's a racial thing, the person was not listening, the person was not putting his hands on, the person right. was fighting with the police, and then you get the added stuff in the paper that adds to it by saying White officer, black suspect. And, and, you know, and why and, is that, though, Tom? Th that's just a build. I, I know. I know. Sensationalism. Sensationalism. But also, I'm projecting my perception on you. 
I agree. And what, what I would hope the is, no, no, I, I know. And what, what I would hope to do is that, well, what I would like to do is, is look at the situation objectively first, right? What happened here without any type of bias at first? Hear me out. You know, look at these situation first. Okay, we have an officer comes to a scene, and this is what happened. Okay, so let's be objective. What happened? Okay, after you realize what happened, you, you got to do it objectively without any form of bias. You have to look at things like objectively. Okay, this is the scene. This is what happened. And then as it progresses, as you learn from the context, was it motivated by racial bias? Or was it just a, a scene where the person was not I listening and well, the let, officer had to do something? But let, let me bring it to that point too. Now, again, I was on the shooting response team. So, same thing, unbiased. The great, we present, on the shooting response team, we don't investigate the crime, we investigate the use of force right, right, right. against the individual. So bear with me. If that occurs, we conduct our investigation. How do I prosecute your perception? You can't, you can't. But it's so easy to, to point the finger at your perception and you're like, that's not what I was thinking. Well, yes it was, it had to be. But the bottom line is, how do you go back, and, and, and if it is racially biased, that, that's what we're talking about. <coughs> there's going to be a pattern of, of But you got to have something in the, but, but also, there's got to be, a, a, like, let's say you're dealing with an officer who, you're, you're looking for a history. You know, what's the history you. of this person? But, but having said that, the problem here is that when you have these communities that are plagued with this history, are the people using current history, or are they using history that's from 1960? You know, or even sooner. But 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 again, just to be fairness here is what I would like to see is I would like to see a, a you know a truly objective investigation before it gets released to the media. And I know people want answers oh, right whoa, away. Whoa, 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 whoa. I know we'll never oh, have. Oh stop! Yeah, but but wait a minute. So you're talking about transparency. But yeah, yeah, that's the problem. You know, that's one thing that the book mentioned. Like when you had the little on, they wanted the video out right quick. Okay, that's fine. But the problem is, here's the dilemma with that. If I, I got I got to get this thought out. The dilemma here is this: is that if you release the video too quick and the facts are not there, the public's perception will grow into the wrong light. And then the problem with that is that when the person is found not guilty, it's no longer the, it's no longer just the incident, it's more the system has been broken. Because, the, the, because I, I, listen, I know we need, listen, I understand the fact that there's gotta be transparency, Definitely. right? Um, I know the fact that there's got to be transparency. I know that's part of the, the changes in law enforcement on Chicago's facing right now. The, the transparency of um, you know getting the videos out quicker, the body cams. I mean, New York just got uh, hit up with a bunch of body cams, which to me, I'm good with that. I mean, I work in a prison setting. I got cameras all around me. I don't worry about that. But, but, but having said that, the, the, the issue here is that, is that when, when, I, when I mean about transparency is you got the videos, hold on, let's just take a look at everything. Because the problem here is that if it gets out too quick, without people really understanding what happened, because you, remember, you're not getting everything, you're getting a snippet, you're getting a thing out of context. So if, you, if the person gets the video without the context in play, then if they're gonna run amok with all the things that relate to their bias and what they want. That's their perspective I'm worried about. And having right. said that, there's no chance for us, at that point, it's too late for us to counter that. So even if the cop was 100% right, you know, but, 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 but I gotta have one more thing too. When you release it too soon, without the facts there, hear me out, I know they want the transparency, and let's just say at this point the officer's correct. This is only if the officer's correct. You could be risking that officer's life. Absolutely. You know, you, you could be easily putting that officer's life at risk. Well, and also keep in mind too, and we gotta keep in mind, grand jury proceedings are closed. The, the evidence that, that the officer takes statements from victims, witnesses, uh, again, I gotta bring up Ferguson, right? All these witnesses saw all this nonsense, right? Turned out the witness, the false Not statement. a single yeah. witness saw his hands up, don't shoot. It was a complete false narrative. Which carried weight, though, because of people thought it was true. Did. Why? Because the media carried it every single station. And, and the next thing you know, I want to add something, too. There's a thing where you can influence, um, like here, as a cop, you're going to know this. When a scene happens, you got to get to those witnesses fast. Because if you don't get with those fast, they can be affected by what other people say. And you gotta isolate. Correct? And you gotta well, isolate them. Yeah, you gotta isolate them because they could be affected by. Oh, well, it was a red opinions. sign. I thought it was a blue sign. You know what? Right? Maybe it was a blue sign. You know. So those other opinions, and you gotta get to them quick. You know. So in this case here, if there's enough momentum saying that a false narrative, hands are up. There's a good chance that momentum now can carry weight with a lot of people. It did. It did. And because guess what? Because you have to get through. You have to take their statements down quick, and then. Right. Having said that, then when you go back and say, well, you never said this before, why are you saying it now? Uh, well, guess what? 
to me, your, your statement that makes sense the most would be the statement done right after the incident, not the statement that done weeks later when there's too much influence going on and you can change right. your narrative. So, but, and that's another reason why, again, if there's a, a body camera... I'm okay request, with that. So am I. However, the investigation has to be concluded first. If I have a body okay, camera right here and I'm, I'm videotaping you right now, well, there may be a camera over here I need to look at also. Right. Because maybe it's going to show something behind your back that I didn't get to see that you were reaching for that maybe there was a gun or an Or maybe see. something that shouldn't get released to the public without the proper evaluation because there's a security concern. You know, like like we you know we go through the prison stuff. You know, you don't want to get stuff out there because you don't you want to make sure that you have the right people looking at everything in the video because you want to make sure that you've crossed your T's and you dotted your I's. And it's not to cover anything up. I'm not saying that, but it's to make sure that there's something that doesn't get out there that can no. threaten <coughs> the security of the investigation or the integrity of the investigation or just the security of the overall uh, in my case it would be the prison you know the right. integrity of the facility well, so but, but, but and that investigation is not just criminal I, I got it's not you got the civil aspect and, of it all. And, that, and that makes a huge difference too and that's like the, the, the but, fed but see, that, that, that to me gets me upset because if the person's uh, again I, and I always say the three lawsuits the departmental the, the civil the criminal you know my problem here is this is if the person is found not guilty departmentally, not guilty criminally, you know, for whatever state or federal court it would be, you can still go after them civilly, civilly right. and it's they can still right. make money it's double from, jeopardy, right. it, it, you know. It is double jeopardy, and the cops say that, and, and, and again, same situation. You know, they're like, oh, well, too bad, civilly are different, there's different courts, there's different civil rights violations, and, and, and again, it, a lot of it's politically motivated, you know. So, again, look at Baltimore. Yeah. The indictment of those officers. Come on! If you saw the actual evidence that was presented, it's no one in their right mind would have would have would have proceeded with with a of, of, of guilty plea. It was so quickly done in a knee jerk reaction to to, to for political expediency. Right. I don't care what anybody says. No, what it is, what it is, what it is, and and also limelight. I indicted this officer. Oh, oh. Oh, good for you. Oh, well, you should be, you're an idiot. That's what well, you are. Is, I always tell people there's no room for politics in, in law enforcement only because you're too worried about tomorrow and the people on the front line are doing it right now. Right. You know, so, so the thing is when you get these people that are looking to maneuver positions because they're more worried about uh, who, who's going to see them 10 years when they want to run for this office. Well, the problem is, is that you're abandoning the people that need you now. You can't be worried about what's going on 10 years from now when you have incidences going on right now now right in the moment and, and and again just to kind of further elaborate on this i know there's a divide oh sir can i get another water too thank you, thank you. i know that there's a divide and, and it's it, it sucks you know, there's a divide between the community and the police but as i said we'll, we'll move on to the next topic is the only way we're going to move forward with that divide is to kind of and this is hard to say because it's, it's 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 a troubled past like you mentioned it is and we're not going to minimize or negate that and there's no way i'm minimizing the gate in the past of you know what this community went to, but having said that, if we're gonna to try to meet in the middle, and this is where this book does, there's, I'm telling you, this book does have some of that middle ground. We have to have that middle ground to really see what's going on. But having said that, it's an understanding on both sides. It's not just an understanding from the community, um, you know, us understanding the community's perspective, it's also understanding of you understanding our perspective. Yeah, well, you know, you know and we can fix that. And it, it comes down to using technology to fix that, Anthony. Thank you. Bottom line is we have these shoot, don't shoot simulators at our police academies. All right, you know what? Get a bus, get a, get a you know a church bus, load fifty people who want to criticize the police the most, or if they're into anybody, you want to talk shit about the police, that's fine. You know, get on the bus. We drive them to the police academy and put them in different scenarios and see how they react, and then give them a quick tutorial. Listen, we're not here to hurt you. We're not here to frustrate you. We want to educate you in reference to what our lives are about and what our threats are about. And, and you know what, you make it your, we're not here to make you feel good about yourself. That's something else we need to get, we're not the, I need to kiss your ass please. We need to get away from that. Because I can't ever keep you happy. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. We, I'll provide you service of protection and, and give you some proactive policing to make sure you don't be a victim of a crime and so forth. But I'm so tired of the fact that people think we need to kiss their ass to, to make sure we keep our jobs. That's not our job. I may offend you and knock you over to get to somebody else who I need to arrest. And you know what, I'll say excuse me later or pick you up and apologize if I have to. But you know, you gotta start respecting who I am and what my job is. And people have forgotten that totally. Right. But bring them into the police element. Bring the community into the police academy and I teach agree. them. Because it, it, it will grant the other perspective that's needed. But having said that, I mean, 
We can argue our perspective. On the corrections too. Well, yeah. Well, that's another thing. Welcome people to the shadows. Like, Absolutely. We do. But Open the doors. Listen, get get a tier. Listen, get like a half a tier, right? You can re relocate your prisoners or inmates. Relocate them, get a half a tier, and, and, and put those civilians in uniforms and then have the, the inmates, See, the, the, the correction officer be inmates. Wait, but the, the dilemma, yeah, we could do that, like a little mock. mock. Why not? Yeah, but the, the, the thing is, is that it's still never going to be enough to really give them a response. Because you're not, you know, a, a few hours will never define a 25-year career. I disagree but, with you. But, I disagree with you. Hey, listen, if I go in front of a simulator, people are sensitive. If I go in front of a simulator and I'm shooting at a simulator with, with, a, with a firearm and stuff's being shot, there's a simulator to shoot back at you. And all of a sudden you start getting shot at. You will never forget no, no, that no, experience. No, no, I agree, but the problem is because they don't live it every day, I, I know you're saying won't forget because they don't live it every day, they're still susceptible to influence where we live it every day. We breathe it every day, and it remains with us. When I wake up, it's with me. When I go to bed, it's with me. It doesn't no, leave me. It's not a, a, a quick few-hour event, and the next thing you know, well, I'm glad I'm out of it, and then you get the influence from the other side. We're always going to be surrounded by who we are. Because we 25, let me tell you something. I, I mean, it's hard for me to say, and I, I'm sure we, I, maybe there's an attempt to it, but you can't, a few days will never be compared to a 25-year career, you know, right. or 20, you know and, and also, you know, they also know that they're going to be safe. Anybody that's going through these situations, in the back of their mind, they could jump, they could be scared, but they know they're going to be safe. The officer that's going through a dark alley, the, the officer that works in corrections who's go entering a riot, we don't have that in the back of our mind. We don't right. know. So I think that the people that go through that simulator, to some extent, they may jump, they may get nervous, they may get a little scared, but at the end of the day, they're going to leave unharmed. Sure. Where we don't have that. Right. So I really don't think you're ever going to get that full effect. But I want to jump with something. Dallas Police Union... Um, they're getting ready to do the um, the uh, so honor black, the honor so the five black officers. Matter, right? Well, well, the, the five officers who were killed in July seventh ambush. They're getting ready to honor them on May seventeenth, and uh, they actually the family of the officers, the widows of the fallen officers, the fallen heroes. Uh, they don't want the mayor uh, going to the event. I just want to. Why is that? Quick, well, I got I got the quote right here. I want to read it to you. Um, so real quick, the five officers who were killed in July seventh ambush will be honored on May seventeenth. The police memorial day and the union says they don't want the mayor there it's not just union but it's the wives too the widows and it's coming from police one so just hear me out in a letter to mayor mike rawlings released tuesday the dallas fraternal order police said several widows have asked him not to attend due to his lack of support of public safety the letter states rawlings rhetoric that he's displayed over the past several years towards police has hit an all-time high the widows of the slain dallas police uh, police officers are suffering due to your actions the retirees of the police department are suffering due to your actions. Dallas FOP President Michael Walton wrote, the current members of the department that are left are suffering due to low pay and officers are leaving a record number under your watch. I, I just want to add to this too real quick. First off, um, it goes to show you when you quickly um, jump to the public's perspective without actually listening to your officers to see what's really going on. The, the political pool and how you make a decision based on what your next... Um, election result. Election result will be. Yeah. So, so, so in this case here, I like the fact that um, there is a you, you had five officers, five heroes that were killed on July seventh from Micah Johnson. If I remember, that was the guy. Who cares? There. Right. You're right. Shit. Killed. You're right. Hundred percent. Killed. Killed the five officers. Right. And then what happens here is that now, at a chance to remember these officers, a chance to do the right thing. I love the fact that. The union stepped up and said, you know what, because you never supported us before, Don't you be ain't doing it now. You know why? Because when you do it now, it's political. Right, right. And, and also, it's factual. They're, they're not just calling these, this is factual. Officers are leaving that job because they're going to other agencies, getting higher pay, better. And also, Dallas police are also suing Black Lives Matter because they created an atmosphere that murdered city. police officers. They created an atmosphere, which I, I hope every, I hope those litigants, I hope they, they get hundreds of millions of dollars. Because the, the, the Black Lives Matter, that section of the movement was murderous. Right. And, and, it, and it caused murder. It caused Well, mayhem. he said it. He said he was racist. Remember, he wanted to kill white people. He said that. Um, hey, real quick. I, I got I to mention a story real quick. Uh, it's, it, it relates to Cooks County facility. You guys got to hear this real quick. Chicago inmates can now order pizza directly uh, to their cells. But uh, it's, it's, it may sound weird at first, but inmates in the Cook County Jail... Uh, can now order pizza delivered directly to their cells. The medium security prison has allowed pretrial detainees to use their commissary to purchase pizza cooked on the premises. So the pizza is cooked on the premises, and now they're working on getting maybe other food done. So basically, I, I mean, it really, I know some people are looking at it like, oh my God, they're getting outside pizza. They didn't say outside pizza. It's saying that they're going to, and the money goes towards 
hopefully some positive funding. Well, I don't know it, listen, if it increases happen. morale, lowers the officers' injuries, and yeah. if, if the shittums aren't acting up, the inmates, if they're not acting up and, and causing a ruckus, who cares? I, no, I, don't, I don't see a big problem. They're having pizza in their cells. No, no, no. And, and, and as I said, people don't realize, like, more these are pre-trial, right? Pre-trial are, detainees. So and, wait, and, so they're not... They're not. They're, you're right. Guilty. And actually, you just reminded me of something. Just they're now. innocent until yeah, found, found guilty. guilty. They have not been. But found wait, you guilty. just reminded me of something. Hold on to that thought. I have something with that. Sure. But guys, just be advised. We in corrections sometimes inmates have things so we can take stuff away. A lot of people don't realize that. Like, why are inmates giving so much? They're giving stuff so we can maintain control. You know, they're giving stuff. And so people that don't work in a prison setting, you got to realize that if inmates had nothing, they'd have nothing to lose. Hey, real quick, Aaron Hernandez. That's right? a smart point. But 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 it's the truth. But it gets overlooked a hundred times. I agree. That's why I'm presenting it out here now. Aaron Hernandez. Right? Okay, now we know he killed himself, right? He right. hung himself uh, in his cell. Yes. Uh, basically, you're going to get rich. He knew, right? So now, of course, you know that the judge uh, said that now they're going to throw away the uh, charge or his guilty finding on the murder from 2013 because of the rule in Massachusetts, because he still had an appeal. Technically, he's not guilty, uh, whatever the case may be. So now the, the guilty does not stand because he and, and even the suicide doesn't abate that guilt right. either. Now, I have a problem with that. So again, I have a problem with that. Let me get your thought on that. So, so he is able now to take his own life, not be found guilty, and now the money that he's going to get. I mean, I feel sorry for his daughter. Don't get me wrong, but there is a victim involved here. They're not the victim's family is not going to get anything at all. But how do you feel about the fact that the suicide does not lift? Uh, or the, I'm sorry, the suicide still doesn't say, you know what, that suicide doesn't count. Uh, unfortunately, the he will stand as still being guilty yeah. from that charge in 2014. Well, this is my... I'm 2013. I have a spiritual answer to that. It, it, according to my faith, you kill yourself, you burn in eternity. So, uh, yeah, good luck with that. So, flame on, uh, you screw. Aaron, you, good, you, you left here your door some money, okay, but you're, you're... I do not want to be him at this very moment, put it that way. Um, does it take away from the victimization, uh, the compensation? Yeah, it does. Because um, he's not a guilty man. He actually died an innocent man. <clears throat> right. So, formally, he died an innocent man. Well, according to the law. Right. But everyone knows he's guilty, right, for the most part. But no innocent people. He killed. knew he was guilty. Right. So, with that said, it is what it is. It's a formality in the law that we have to accept. And, and I say that because our system is imperfect. And that's something else that makes me nuts, too. People oh, our system's broken. It's not broken. It's not perfect. There's other systems that don't work at all. You know, we have due process. So may a thousand innocent people go free and one innocent man be found guilty. That's like the gist of what we go with. Yeah. So bear with me. In this situation, there's a loophole. He found it. He, he used it. He got He pulled it that's off. what they do. It is what it is. However, in other countries, they cut your arms off if you're just accused. In other countries, that if you're a different sexual or different uh, sexual orientation, they throw you off a building, you know, or, or they chop your head off, or they mutilate your your, your genitalia. Your genitalia. That, that makes sense, you know, that, that's ridiculous. ridiculous. So with that ridiculousness of other systems, keep that in mind. It makes this one look, actually it's not that bad. No, and it's not that bad. And, and yes, uh, O.J. Simpson. Look at O.J. Simpson, right? All that DNA, the one scene, all O.J.'s DNA, the two other victims' DNA. Listen, I think he was guilty. I know he's guilty. He was found guilty in civil court, whatever, and then he commits a kidnapping and throws himself in prison anyway. But that's a whole other story. But again, he was found not guilty. Doesn't mean he wasn't guilty. Just mean the, the evidence that his attorneys were able to suppress and the evidence that were presented wasn't enough. And that's what happens. Do I think he was guilty? 100%. However, I have to accept the court's decision saying it's not guilty. I'm not rioting because O.J. Simpson was no, walking the planet. we got to keep that in mind. Oh, and here was a black man killing a white woman. Oh, that, if you want to bring race into it, we don't have to bring race into it. Race wasn't an issue in this case, which I thought was interesting with O.J., by the way. Yeah, yeah. He, had a beautiful, he had a beautiful blonde, beautiful wife, successful sports star. And in a lot, of, a lot of dynamic characters in that in that portrayal, right? But the race car wasn't pulled out, except when it was necessary. You know, if it doesn't fit, you got to equip, right? You never forget that. Mark Furman. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable, Mark Furman, right? You use, the, you drop the end bomb. You know, this is that appropriate? No, no, it's not. However, he used it. He admitted he, he was caught out there, and and that was used for the for the defense. It happens. 
I accept that because that's that's our court system. As an American, I understand it's not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than what the rest of the world has. Right, and and, then, and I agree. I'm saying, like, in my case here, though, you're right. My argument here, though, is, is even with the, the, the letter saying you're rich now and stuff like that, you could see there was a motivation. You can see that he they're saying that he had conversations about asking about that law. But you're right. It is what it is. Um, I just so wanted to bring it up. But how, how are you going to combat that? You can't. You can't. And, and you mentioned a very good point. For when I was on the Al Sharpton show, I, I mentioned something where the perspective of the community is worrying about the innocent amongst the guilty. Well, we worry about the guilty amongst the innocent because of the overall security of things. And I think there's a conflict there, but there's also a way to meet in the middle. You know, and there is. You know, like if I'm sitting there spending all my time trying to eliminate um, the threat, that means I'm going to go through the innocent. To get to who I got to get to to protect everybody, but in some cases here, the public may think, "Well, you got to protect the innocent when the threat still exists." So, like right. again, you're in the prison, right? You have a riot, right? You lock down the prison the next day. Then you start getting people calling. Well, my son wasn't involved. Yeah, but we don't know. But he wasn't involved. He's been locked down. But we don't know. So because we don't know, we're not going to lift doors and let people run free until we know where the threat is. Now your son may be innocent, and that could be the case. But also by doing this, we're keeping him safe. Right. Because we let him out and he gets hurt. What are you going to do? You're going to sue us again because we didn't do the proper investigation before right. we let people out. Now. Here's one last question. I want to end the show now, but I, I got one question I want to ask you. It's a sure. question we floated on. My, my ultimate goal, I'm an honest guy. My ultimate goal is for police officers to be judged by their actions, not based on their No, I agree. We got that. And also, also the community to, to understand, respect us. And understand our perspective. And our officers be held at a higher standard, which they are already. And, and also take the extra couple minutes to tell the community what they're doing and why they're doing right, it. Right, but can I tell you something? It takes a lot of kissing people's ass. I, it takes a lot for us to even have this conversation because we feel that even by saying certain things will be labeled, but on the other side, they yeah. can talk more freely. And I disagree with that. So it's good that we have a conversation. It's still done being respectful. And again, welcome anybody to have the table to have that conversation with us. But right. I, I have a question. This was asked the other day. It's going to be our question of the day from one of my uh, followers on Facebook. And I thought this would be a good question to pose. I'll ask you and I'll give you my thoughts. I haven't answered this because... Uh, I really don't know how I'm going to answer this. But let's say you have a good friend, right? Good friend, law enforcement, you guys have been buddies for quite some time. And he gets accused of doing something that could be major. Could be major, right? And, and maybe there's a chance he did it, but you don't know, right? Would you call him? Would you try to help him? Knowing that you're in the job with him too, maybe he's being investigated for doing something foolish, but he's a good friend of yours. Because the one officer that posed the question was he had a, he had a uh, an officer, his buddy. They were real close. Um, his buddy got accused of doing something really foolish, and I think he believes that the officer did it. He does, uh, but he said that he's also friends with this guy, and he wants to know: Do you think it's a good advice if you call him? So a majority of the audience was kicking back, saying, "Call him. He's your friend. He's your buddy. He's your brother in blue." But then there were a few that were like, "Ah, eh, wait a second. Yeah, here's my, I, I can I can answer that because I had a, a, a closer a similar situation. I worry about officers killing themselves. That's what. So that that's my key component. If he's my friend, and I'm worried about him hurting himself. And and, and we're talking about charges that are, are uh, the he could be going to prison. Yeah, yeah. So extreme I'm, charges. Extreme charges. Plus, I'm not an idiot. I'm an investigator also. So I know they may be up on his phone also because I'm a paranoid guy in reference to internal affairs and so forth. I would call him and simply say this, say it's you, which is not, you know, which is hypothetical. Anthony, how you doing? Hey, listen, I heard what's going on. I don't want to know anything about it, but I want you to know that I care about you. I love you. And if you need something from me, you can call upon me. But I don't want to know what's going on, but don't don't think that there's something that you can't overcome with with, with your friends and your family. That's all I'm saying to you. And, you know, and, that, so, and keeping it like that, because if that guy starts, you know, I'm so, if I'm still a sworn police officer, I'm still a sworn police officer, so keep that in mind. I got you. He's going to know that that I care for him well enough that I don't want him taking his own life. And that's my major concern. Right, and then I want to say something. And plus, keep that. in mind, if, some, if he's up on a wire, if if so, you're, so, you're going to be on tape. Right, right, and, and I want to also say something, too. When I make that decision, I'm going to make the decision at that point, because I know the guy, whatever it is, I may make the decision morally, not professionally. And what I mean by that is, I'm, I'm buddies with him, like you just mentioned. I have to agree with you on that. And the fact is, if he does do something, I can limit him. I'm not going to get involved in any investigation. It's just a simple call saying, hey, is everything going? I don't want to talk about your case, but are you good? You okay? So the decision is now more me, my morals. I, you know, this is someone I know as opposed to a professional decision. So uh, just real quick, I thought we covered a lot today. You know, even a professional uh, decision, you got to make a, 
you got to understand whatever he says to you, if you get asked or requested to... You just got to speak it up. But I don't think you get... I, I mean, I think it would be hard to automatically, uh, as an investigator, I mean, you know why the guy called, you hear it on the phone, you got to admit that maybe someone's immediate action. Now, unless the investigator told you, don't call him and you do, that's one thing. But now... Well, that's it, instruction. It, yeah, that's, that's instruction. Right, instruction. but if no one's telling me that, there's always a good chance that, you know what, I do know him. Maybe he's not guilty because you don't know anymore. And let me just make sure he's okay. But again, you got to make sure that you never know who's listening. But again, morally, it, unless I'm being told... like I think It's also about lifting, lift, lifting a sense of guilt. Like, if I'm being told I can't talk to him... And he, God forbid, he does hurt himself. God forbid. I may be able to justify the fact that I could not talk to him because investigative-wise, I was told not to. But having said that, if he offed himself and there really wasn't that restriction on me or that I knew of there wasn't that restriction, right. that may be harder for me to deal with. What about if he wasn't guilty? Right. What about if he wasn't? Well, that's, that, and, and, and again, my, my experience is what I've done in the past uh, for officers who I knew very close and officers who were acquaintances and even officers I didn't know were asking for advice. This, and, and this is now retired to a whole lot easier because I'm a civilian not to tell anybody anything. Well, yeah, but as I but, said, you know, we're always in... My job as a police officer, I'm, I'm your brother in blue. Before anything else, bro, we'll get through this. But that's the key. The key is to, you know, it's not being selfish, but the key is, am I going to be okay? Like, with whatever the outcome could possibly be. Like, do I feel compelled? Because you mentioned a good point, but my, my thing yeah. is... But so, working in internal affairs, I've worked in so many years. Listen, usually the person makes their own bed, and now it's time to sleep in it. Right. So I, I, my I, job is to say, if you're going to sleep in your bed, so be it. At least I know what bed you're sleeping in. You're not hanging from a noose. No, right, and I'm not arguing that, obviously. I'll put a gun in your mouth. But, yeah. but, but as I said, I mean, just to answer the question that was posed on the board, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was one of the things. So again, though we covered a great show. Matt, you got anything you want to say in closing? No, no. Uh, first and foremost, thank you uh, so much. And, and again, uh, this show is about getting to the truth of the matter. We don't we don't have any filters, you know. Our, our brothers in blue and, and our community together, we have to work together. You know, I'm so beyond this racial issue. It is a political motivation. Uh, it's a political motivator. And yes, have there been issues in the past? Yes. Well, who's who's is going to make the difference? Who's going to take that extra step to end this? And the answer better be you uh, and me. Uh, for talking about this and talking to people when they look at and, and, and make comments that, that you may or may not agree with because you got to start the dialogue. Um, on a private note, again, thank you, uh, supporting rescue leaders and the Body Beacon. Um, we're really, uh, sales are taking off. We're really excited about it. And again, it's the, the world's first patented LED bell keeper. And we're trying to save our rescuers first, uh, our police, fire, EMS, and our tow truck drivers out there. And we thank you for your support constantly. And, uh, and if there's anything we can do for you, please reach out to Anthony or I, because uh, we are honored, literally honored to be here to speak before you. Yeah, guys, hey, as always, a pleasure. Show is tear talk. Guys, you know, it's good to have these discussions because ultimately you never know who's going to listen. You know, you never know who's going to be willing to bring that middle ground. I thought the latter part of the discussion would be great because I'm reading a book called Black and Blue. I'm, I'm halfway through it. I think it's a good attempt only because of what he says at the beginning, which he outlines most of us as professionals and then make sure that uh, we're seen isolated from minorities who make foolish decisions like cops that uh, just, you know, unfortunately uh, they make a bad turn and, and then we wind up getting associated with that negativity. So it was good that he was able to generalize uh, the positive aspect of our field and then write his book. So I'm okay with that. It's the best I've seen so far. It's still a book that has that one-sided perspective, but he opened up with giving us respect and not damning the system, and also promoted the fact of respect for law enforcement and not fear. And then again, you know, uh, next week we'll talk about some correctional issues. I just wanted to, to have Matt on the show. I wanted to mention some stuff about law uh, about about police, and I, I kind of do both shows, police and and, uh, and uh, corrections, because both are law enforcement. And in closing, I want to say kudos to the state of Oklahoma. State of Oklahoma passed the bill. It's a Blue Lives Matter bill. Yep. And it actually has police and corrections. And the reason why I like that is twofold. It doesn't say, first off, it includes corrections, which awesome. is great. Uh, you don't get that much. And But it didn't say law enforcement and corrections. Because I always took that as an insult. It's like, wait a second, we are law enforcement. Why would you isolate that? No, it says police and law enforcement. So again, kudos to Oklahoma protecting those COs and those police. Hoorah. I think that's great. Hoorah. And Hoorah. as always, guys, the show is Tear Talk. Follow us on the venues, download the app, and as always, guys, stay safe. safe. We are out.